Hello and welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much for joining me. Now we've been doing a lot of talk about health. Health is very important. And today I am talking to another fascinating person with a completely different specialism. I'm talking to Natasha Campbell McBride, who is the inventor of the GAPS Nutritional Protocol. Sounds very complicated and uh, curious. So let's let's bring on Nat Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride. Can I call you Natasha? Of course. Thank you so much for coming on. Absolutely fascinating because you're going to introduce us to the gut, but also overall health. Is that correct? Thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. And uh, GAPS is something that a lot of people are familiar with. Right. OK. Well, I, I, it has been around for more than 20 years. Now, you'll have to uh, um, excuse me because I'm I'm very ignorant on a lot of these things. I'm on a, I'm on a journey of exploration. And so all of this is relatively new to me. I'm finding it really fascinating. And it's and I think a lot of my audience are also on that journey, looking away from how big pharma and doctors have just given us pills and we've just obeyed blindly and not really taken responsibility for our own health. And now that I'm at that point where this is, you know, so important that we do. So there'll probably be a crossover, I imagine, of those people that are familiar with it and those people like myself who this is completely new to. So could you tell us a little bit about it? Absolutely. Human body is a microbial community. That's what we now know. Research, science, everybody talks about it. There are more microbes in your body than there are human cells. Far wow. more. You have microbes in your blood, in your lungs, in your heart, in your liver, in your muscles, in your joints, in your brain, in your eyes. But the biggest microbial, microbial community lives in the digestive system. Right. That's the big ministry, the headquarters of your whole microbiome. That's what this microbial community is called nowadays. That's the term microbiome. Microbiome. Why did Mother Nature place majority of them in your digestive system? Because if you ask any microbiologist, what is the most powerful influence on a microbial community in nature? The answer will be immediately food. Mm. You change the food supply to a microbial community in a Petri dish or anywhere else, the whole microbial community changes within hours. Does it? Certain species of microbes disappear, other species appear out of nowhere, and the whole microbial community changed. Where do we place food in our bodies? In the digestive system, of course. That is why the majority of this microbiome, the, the center of it, is in the digestive system. And because the human body is a microbial community, food becomes the most powerful influence on human health. Which there is, is something nothing more powerful that comes even close to the effects of food. On and, that, it, and as you've mentioned that, it just seems so blindingly obvious that, that food, the thing that we put in that fuels us and, and gives us the energy and our, our ability to perform or not, is so vital. And yet, in our modern society, we've, we've kind of ignored that. Yes, I know. I know. It is. It is um, um, the problem is nowadays that because of agricultural chemicals, majority of which are broad spectrum antibiotics, mm. because of the sheer quantity and numbers of these chemicals that are being used in production of food, and uh, not only agriculture, but then what the food industry does with that produce. They add a myriad of other chemicals to it, many of which are also um, antimicrobials. We are eating antibiotics for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for yes. decades now. And, and it's so not, not, not our choice. Food, absolutely. Yes. If you are buying your food in a supermarket, you are eating antibiotics for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and in between. What do antibiotics do? They kill microbes. No antibiotic in the world can kill all of the microbes. They all kill only a part of it. Every microbial community in nature works on harmony, on balance. Every microbe, every species are present in there 
the fungi, bacteria, viruses, archaea, protozoa, all kinds of creatures. As long as they're all present, they all fulfill important functions for us. They work as a community and every one of them control the rest. They do not allow any one of them to get out of control and start causing trouble. When you eat antibiotics, they kill off part of that microbial community and the balance is gone. Mm. The, the, the harmony is gone. You get an, uh, an unbalanced microbial community where certain species get out of control, proliferate very fast and become pathogenic. They right. start causing trouble. They digest food in their own way that you put into your digestive system, producing millions of poisonous chemicals. At the same time, they damage the integrity of your gut wall, making it porous and leaky, literally holes develop in your gut wall. And this river of toxicity absorbs into your blood, into your lymph, get distributed around the body, and wherever this toxic river gets to, it causes disease. Right. If it gets into your joints, you will get arthritis, any kind of arthritis. If it gets into your muscles, you can get muscular disease. If it gets into your heart, you're likely to get atrial fibrillation or some other problem. If it gets into your lungs, you get asthma, you get other lung diseases. If it gets into your brain, you get mental illness. I started my work with, uh, and I call this condition, this situation where your own digestive system is poisoning you and causing disease. I call that situation GAPS, which stands for gut and psychology syndrome and gut and physiology syndrome. Both abbreviate to the same GAPS in the English language. Gut and psychology syndrome was uh, introduced first uh, more than 20 years ago now, because at that time I was working with autism. Autism, ADHD in children, other learning disabilities, mental illness. Then later on, um, I have added to that gut and physiology syndrome because wherever this toxic river gets to, it causes disease. Yes. It can, it can get into all sorts of other uh, organs in the body. So that's the gut and physiology syndrome book, a blue book. It's called Gut and Physiology Syndrome. Well, it's kind of sideways. Yeah, <laughs> look at that. Yeah. Wow. That's right. And that this looks is the thick... psychology syndrome. That looks a thick book. So this one focuses on the brain. This one focuses on the rest of the body. This one's thicker because it's written later. It's right. 2020. It's, it's good. And one does learn all the time new things. And, and is that aimed at the layman or for uh, more? It's aimed at the layman, but it is fully, fully referenced for professionals. So when I was started talking initially uh, 20 years ago about gaps, that it causes autism yes, and causes all mental illness and all learning disabilities, any kind of dysfunction of the brain. Uh, people thought I was a crackpot. Now the science is coming up with a plethora of studies confirming all of this. Yes. We now know that the gut microbiome causes autism and causes Alzheimer's disease, and causes schizophrenia, causes every other mental illness. And now there are studies coming out saying that gut microbiome causes rheumatoid arthritis and multiple sclerosis and eczema and asthma and psoriasis and any other disease. Is it all can I, diseases are born in the gut? So can this I can I made by Hippocrates thousands of years ago? Right. And, uh, today so can I do, we absolutely agree with it. So again, I, I don't want to inter interrupt too much, but I. And I'm sure you'll cover this, but um, if you change your food, then and you change the what's in your the the, the microbio um, stuff in your gut, will you correct some of those functions like autism and ADHD and learning difficulties? Are you able to heal or at least partly? Absolutely. Absolutely. That is my work. And that is the work of many other health practitioners around the world. And this is fantastic. With autism, if you if you would like me to talk about autism to start with, because mm. that's the first disease I was uh, dealing with 20 years ago or longer. Almost 100% of modern autistic children and all the people were born with a perfectly normal brain. They were perfectly normal children when they were born. But what happened to them? Their parents, their mother and father, passed to them abnormal gut flora. 
because they grew up in a modern world exposed to antibiotics, exposed to agricultural chemicals and all the other pollutants in our environment. So they had damaged microbiome themselves and that is what they passed to their child. Yes. The mother passes it during pregnancy, the father passes it through sexual contact through the mother. So, and then during the birth, when the child goes through the birth canal, the child acquires large amounts of the flora of the mother and the father. So, if these children acquire abnormal gut flora right from the start, that flora then damages the integrity of the gut wall in the baby. It converts the food that the baby has, even the mother's milk, even wow. the breast milk, converts into a river of toxicity. This toxicity gets into the brain of the child and poisons the brain. So the brain does not develop the way it should. Depending on the mixture of toxins, depending on various other factors, in that situation, the child may develop autism. That's the worst situation. Or the child may become hyperactive, develop attention deficit disorder, dyslexia, dyspraxia, oppositional defiant disorder, or any other difficulty in mental development, any other mental problem. Plus epilepsy. Really? Epilepsy. Yeah. Epilepsy is a safety valve for the brain of the, of the child or adult. When the, this level of toxicity in the brain builds up too high, in the proportion of these children or adults, the brain develops a safety valve, a cleansing procedure, when it sends one electric discharge through and cleans the whole lot of toxicity. Oh, right. This fact has been known in uh, classical psychiatry for hundreds of years, because uh, for hundreds of years, they didn't have uh, medications to suppress the brain activity. Right? Yes. So psychotic individuals were basically kept in a cage. And what they've observed that when a, a, a person in psychosis had an epileptic seizure, when they come out from it, they are normal. Good gosh. The brain cleansed and right. all the psychosis disappears. These people become perfectly normal. But then as the toxicity keeps coming from the gut, it builds up again and the person slides back into schizophrenia. Yes. Into psychosis. So the cycle so that just is keeps what going epilepsy around. is. Mm -hmm. Wow. So from my point of view, epilepsy is a GAPS disorder. Autism is a GAPS disorder. Every learning disability, every mental illness is a GAPS disorder. So if you, uh, are, if you change your diet and you, you reduce those toxins where you can, you're going to start seeing a change as your body is rebuilding as it should. Absolutely. So the GAPS diet that has been developed is created specifically to bring balance and harmony back to that microbial community in your gut. Right. And through that headquarters of your microbiome, it will bring balance and harmony to your whole microbial community everywhere in your body. So regardless how far away from your gut a disease might have manifested itself, maybe you have psoriasis, maybe you have chronic cystitis, maybe you have migraines, Yes. or chronic fatigue syndrome, or fibromyalgia, or multiple sclerosis, or Guillain-Barre, or, or something else like that. Regardless how far away from the gut, when you fix that microbial community in your gut, make it harmonious, balanced again, it will fix those diseases. This, is so, this is so powerful. Very powerful. I mean, this, you know, this is, I mean, it's absurd that we live in a world today in the 21st century and, and your amazing research that this isn't headline news and everyone's just doing it. I guess but there's not, not, there's no money in it for uh, certain invested interests. That's a whole big conversation. Yes, well, I, we won't go there, but I'm just, I, 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 but, but yeah. because I'm new to this, I'm not just accepting it and going, oh, yeah, no, it's, it's all so true. But it is overwhelming. I mean, I know people with, with some of those conditions that you've, you've said, and some people have suffered for, for this for years, not realising that the simplicity of the answer to, to change their diet to a, a, a better diet, to the to the diet you mentioned we'll talk about that hopefully um but it's it's just that whole thing about being empowered to be able to do that and not as you say go into a supermarket with all this modern industrial highly processed foods and move away from from that and you know it's just astonishing really absolutely there's nothing more powerful 
in its effect on health and disease than food. Yes. And GAPS diet is extremely powerful. When I've written my first book in 2004, I never expected for this concept to spread the way it did. But uh, now GAPS is a global phenomenon. My first book has been translated into 26 languages. We've wow. got more translations coming in. I'm not translating them. People <laughs> in their own, people do their own countries yes, yes. are doing that. And uh, uh, millions of people literally are using this protocol all over the world. We train practitioners. We train other people uh, on in how to implement and how to help uh, people to implement this protocol. I have a, 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 a website called gapstraining.com where we train individuals. And we have training courses there for lay people who would like to just follow the protocol. So if they join that training course, we can take them literally by hand and lead them through the whole protocol. It isn't simple, this protocol. It isn't easy, but it is extremely powerful. Wow. We have miracles every day happening. I started with autism, then that spread to all other learning disabilities and all other mental illnesses. And then as I was working with children and families, I realized their parents are not healthy, not well. They have chronic fatigue syndrome and they have allergies and they have fibromyalgia and asthma and skin problems and mental problems. And uh, what I've discovered as I started working with the parents as well and with the whole family, that all of them are ill because of the same cause. Yes. The cause of all of these illnesses is gaps. Yes. All diseases begin in the gut. Every one of them, every chronic disease. And as we put the whole family on the gaps nutritional protocol, the whole family heals from all kinds of illnesses. I have been receiving letters and emails from people from all over the world for years who have never had any consultations with anybody. They just got the book, followed the... Uh, the advice because it's a it's a self-help book right and all information is there and there's a lot of information online as well and uh, they recover from all kinds of illnesses which i've never worked with <laughs> i have no experience yes and uh, i haven't described in my books that is amazing that is, amazing. is amazing i mean i think the i mean the human body is is an incredible um thing it's just uh, and the more that you you explore it the more incredible it it becomes and what i found on this journey and, and this of course is not going to be a surprise to you but it's a huge surprise to me and anybody watching who is sort of beginning the same journey is so much that we have been told is upside down with you know the convenience of the modern day living seems to be on the one hand, very convenient, and yet at the, at the other hand is, is doing us down in lots of different ways. And, and yet, if we found the right balance, it, it could still be convenient and our health could be so much better. Human body is a miraculous creation. All the healing is programmed into you. Whenever you heal from any illness, it's your own body that does the work. It's your mm. own body that heals itself. All you have to do is work with it and allow it to do the work. If you go to the doctor and get the pill to stop the symptoms, then you are not helping your body. First of all, you don't trust your body. Mm. You do not allow it to do the help, uh, to do the healing, to heal itself. On top of that, you're beating it on the head with uh, various chemicals which will interfere in the healing process. Because what is symptoms? Pain inflammation, swelling, limitation of function. It's your body communicating to you that you are damaging it. You're doing something yes. wrong. How else is your body going to let you know that you are damaging it? Well, yes. By giving you pain, by giving you all these unpleasant symptoms and manifestations. So that you, so you do something. Doctor, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So if you go to the doctor and get the pill to stop the pain, to stop the inflammation, to stop this and that and the other, to beat the symptoms down, what are you doing? You telling your body to stop calling for help yes. and suffer in silence. Absolutely. That is all you're doing. Yeah. For some people, that's convenient. Some people are happy with that. They're happy to take that route. But many people are not. Many people would like to get to the root cause of their problems and to get rid of them as a root cause. Yes. And in, in that case, you have to work with your body. And you have to understand that your body is, a, is part of nature. 
you have to work with natural means. There is no clever science. There is no clever doctor, the clever somebody who can just come and fix you. You have to do the work. Right. And the first thing you have to change is your diet because your body is a microbial community and food is the most powerful influence on any microbial community. Wow, yes. Well, and as you say, and, and as you say it again, it just I said it before, but it seems so obvious, but we've we've we're so removed from a nature but also from listening to ourselves we've we've almost become very childlike that we let other people tell us what we should be doing and we don't listen to ourselves anymore and so this is it's incredibly empowering to hear you speak like this because many people you get that and I'm going to use a, a cliche phrase that gut feeling that you should be doing something else but somebody will say no 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 t you know just have an aspirin or a paracetamol or whatever and it will be all right when actually you might just need s some more water or some fruit or you know vitamin c or something like that we are very powerful human beings we we are mighty creatures powerful powerful uh, creatures and every one of us has to keep that power to ourselves yes every time you go and take advice from someone else and allow that person to meddle with your health, you are giving that power away. Yes. And who is more interested in your health, you or that person? Y yes, absolutely. Unless they've got a financially invested interest in you, of course. Absolutely. So you, you, uh, by changing your diet, by changing your lifestyle, by stopping using toxic things that are damaging your body, damaging you, you are showing love to yourself, mm. care to yourself, and you are holding that mighty power within your own hands and and healing always follows and not only healing but transformation because we are not just bodies we are spiritual beings first and foremost and then we have a mind as well which is a powerful tool of that spirit the spirit is supposed to use the mind not mm. the other way around and then we have the body the jacket the temple where we live in, in the, the jacket that we create out of materials in this world and then when we die, we drop it like a ton of bricks and we go back home, right? So that's that's what the body is. So we're yes. not bodies. We are spiritual beings. We are divine beings. We have minds. It's a powerful tool and we have a body. And if you employ all of those, if you act as a spirit, as a God, not just as a, some physical body, mm. giving yourself to somebody to fix me kind of thing. No, no. It's your temple. You fix it. You clean it, you keep it in uh, in check, and you keep it in good order. You mentioned your mind there, and and it reminded me that sometimes certain foods can can give you mood swings. You know, some something can sometimes bring you down, and you eat something, and you you feel a lot more elated, or your mood changes. It, presumably, that's all part of the same thing. Absolutely, you know that in the nineties, research has so shown demonstrated that our brain we, we we all run around with the brain thinking that that's the most important thing in mm. us the brain that the brain only one percent of effect it has on the gut but the gut has 90 percent effect on the brain yeah. so in other words your gut has nine times more messengers going to your brain than the messages coming from the brain to the gut Wow. So your gut is the second brain. In fact, many researchers say it's the number one brain in your body because your body is a microbial community. Yes. And the majority of those microbes are sitting in the gut and they're all sending chemical messages to the brain and the brain obeys those messages, follows them. Mm. So if your gut flora is abnormal, pathogenic, because you're feeding it wrong foods and you're eating lots of chemicals, the messages that uh, are going to your brain are pathogenic and you'll get mental illness. It can start with just simple mood swings, forgetting things, not sleeping very well, maybe, you know, being moody, maybe not quite functioning, not, not being, uh, um, not a good cognitive ability, all the way to psychosis, all the way to schizophrenia, all the way to bipolar disorder or something else. So, yeah, so, I, I, it, I mean, it all keeps coming back to the food that you put in and, and the microorganisms in your, in your gut. What sort of things should we be eating then? 
because we all sort of have well, a I sense think... of we all have a sense of okay not processed food and then it becomes a little bit for a lot of people a bit murky you know you think well okay i'll 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 nip down to the uh, market and just grab some vegetables and and if i do that then i'll be all right there's a lot of misinformation mm. about food in the world huge amount of misinformation because uh, we live in a mirror world it, it's been said many times we live in an upside down world yes so if you want to know the truth you have to turn everything upside down and then have a look at it <laughs> and you will see the truth right so there's a huge amount of misinformation in the world about food so when i talk to people about food we have to undo a lot of that misinformation <laughs> first and foremost yes and the uh, gaps diet is quite complex people need to understand of course the first thing we remove is everything processed and the first thing we do we eat we cook at home it is vital for all of us to go back to the kitchen and start cooking from fresh ingredients everything you buy is what mother nature created in that yeah. shape and form not anything in tins bags pre-prepared pre-cooked pre-done none of that so there's no convenience you have to cook yourself that's very very important if you want to heal you have to cook we source the best quality food and that means we have to abandon supermarkets yes we should not be buying food in supermarkets because who stocks the shelves in the supermarkets industrial agriculture what is industrial agriculture every bite of food on those shelves it might look very pretty and, and packaged nicely and all very clean but it's full of chemicals and it is, has a low nutritional value on top of that food is information we are eating information all the time information has a vibration, a certain frequency of vibration. What kind of information you are buying in the form of food in supermarkets? You're buying information, the energy of abuse, greed, suffering, depravity, pain. How is that information going to make you healthy? Yes. We have hundreds of wonderful farmers in Britain organic, natural, regenerative farmers who love their land, love their animals, love their chickens, love their soil, and look after them properly with love. And you find those farmers on farmer's markets. Certainly, if you live somewhere in the city, you can find them on a farmer's market, or you can go online and look for organic, natural, good quality food. The second thing I would do once you've met these farmers at the farmer's market, Take their contact details and ask them, can I visit your farm? A real organic farmer will be delighted. Mm. They've got nothing to hide. So throw your kids in the car on the weekend, go and have a lovely time visiting a farm with your dog, you know, have a good day. And what you want to see, you don't want to see bags of chemicals lying about. <laughs> you don't want to see refrigerators full of no. antibiotics and steroids. You know, you want to see animals on pasture. Because yes. all animals should be on pasture. Cows, sheep, goats, pigs. Pigs should be in a forest, naturally. Chickens, turkeys, they all should all be outside in the sunlight on pasture. Because they're designed to eat a lot of greenery, a lot of grass. And uh, chickens on pasture find their own meat. Because they dig for worms, for grubs, for insects. That's their meat. What do, where do you think the color in the egg yolk comes from? It comes from all the herbs and grasses that chickens eat in abundance. Right. The carotenoids in this plant matter turn into the color in your egg yolk. Where do you think the yellow egg yolk comes from in a supermarket egg? Probably from, from a, a yellow dye added to the feed of the chickens. Right. From a synthetic dye. Which one's going to give you good health? Mm. So you want real, real eggs. Yes. Real meat, real milk real vegetables from a, a rich soil that has been fertilized with manure and compost, not with some sprays, and some no. chemicals, you know. So that's the first thing we need to do, all of us. We need to start getting real food. Supermarket has fake food. Mm. It is not real food. Label organic has been corrupted in the last 10 years. You cannot trust it, particularly in supermarkets. Maybe some real organic produce sneaks in there somehow. 
small percent, but majority of it is corruption and fake. We cannot trust organic label anymore. Mm. You can trust much better some auntie who's got an allotment. Yes, absolutely. Vegetables. Yeah, no, quite. Absolutely. We should all start growing our own vegetables. We should turn those useless lawns we have back to vegetable gardens, have a few chickens in our back garden, have a beehive in our back garden. Everybody should start producing their own food if they want health in their mm. family. Because health is not just eating. Being out there in the sun, in the fresh air, in your garden, growing things, working with your chickens, is a sheer delight. It's an absolute joy. It will give we you so much good health. No matter how stressed you are, you come out in the garden and you talk to your chickens. And yes, you, I, can you hear, your I can hear All your cockerels. All the stress evaporates. I can hear your cockerels in the background. Yes. yes, I'm an organic farmer. I've been working with food for so many years and having worked with food for many years, you realize that you can't trust anyone mm. to produce your food. Not in the Western world, definitely. No, no. People who live in some other countries, you know, um, less developed industrial countries, they have way healthier food. Yes. Much better quality than what we have here. Mm. Unless you work with a good farmer and you buy real food from real farmers because their food has love in it it's full of energy of love you're eating love and that's the only energy that will give you good good health so interesting it's so interesting natasha i mean it just so happens that uh, i've just come back from the farm shop and i have some vegetables and i have some uh, grass-fed meat that they have their own animals from and I've been doing this now for well, about a year or so, moved away from the supermarkets and I cook at home. I cook on a wood burning stove and I do prepare all. And, do you know, there's just something it's so it's it, it takes you away from all the stress of what you do for a living and all, all of that. And you're sitting there or standing there as I am chopping my vegetables that have been grown locally by small scale farmers and you and you do that and the whole process of coming up with something you know sometimes very often it's my own creation because you're just using up what you've got and it's so joyous and you say that to people and sometimes they just look at you as if well, why don't you just slam a pizza in the oven and, and you just go no that's not what it's about it is it's, sometimes it's, it seems hard to get it across of how the the cooking process as well as the eating and enjoying it and then the health that it comes with it is is so part of living health of any nation is held in the hands of people who cook for that nation yes it doesn't come from medical profession it doesn't come from the government it doesn't come from anything like that health of every nation comes from people who cook for that nation if your food is cooked by some faceless factories, by people on some conveyor belt, yes. some takeaway or somewhere who may be in a bad mood, may be very unhappy, may be ill, unwell, you know, what kind of energy will they put into that food? The energy of their illness, of their anger, their resentment, their mm. suffering, what the, 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 you know, whatever it is they're experiencing. Your food should be cooked by a person who loves you. Yes. Who's doing his or her best to put their love into that food. Yes. So cook your own food. It's simple. It's not a rocket science. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> and, and the way you just said that, you know, food is it's off, it commercialized food that's cooked by faceless people who do not know you, will never meet you, most likely. And it's just a job on a conveyor belt. It's interesting you talk about the, the sort of the emotion that they have and the vibrations that they put into the food, that this sort of the spiritual connection that a lot of people don't really think about. Could you just expand on that a little bit? Everything is spiritual in this world. Everything's energy. Material uh, stuff is solidified energy, energy that our senses perceive as material stuff. Mm. But there's lots of things we don't perceive, and everything is spiritual. We are spiritual beings. We are gods. And this body that you live in is only a, a shell right. th that you live in. Imagine you flew to the moon, right? Yes. You can't jolly well jump out of a spaceship in your shorts and T-shirt and run around the moon. 
No. Can you? No, no. because your body is not designed to be in that environment. You have to have a spacesuit. Yes. The same with this environment, this physical environment. A spirit cannot come in itself naked. It needs a spacesuit to interact with this world. So the spirit designs its own body, creates a body for itself as a spacesuit to yes. use within this one lifetime. And uh, then it drops it here, leaves it here and, and goes back where, where it came from. So identifying yourself with the body and thinking that you're just a material body and nothing else is what our mainstream sciences are trying very hard to do to us. We are all um, being convinced at school, at universities, everywhere else, that you're just a material being, that this is just a material, you're an animal. Yes. You know the books of Yuval Harari, who is a globalist from, you know, those satanic circles? Yes. <laughs> He's been ordered uh, to write this book specifically to convince all of us that we are animals, nothing more. And there are lots of the, those books. You know, there's lots of things coming out from uh, the top. Yes. Yeah, to convince us that we are just, there is no spirituality to us. Right. That we have no power. That we are just bodies. That we are just animals. And uh, if you're just an animal, then why not become a cyborg? Yes, why not? You know? So, we are spiritual beings. We are divine beings. That is the most important part of us. If you live your life from that position, from that point of view, everything turns the right way. Nothing's upside down anymore. You, 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 you cannot be deceived. You cannot be bamboozled anymore. Yes. Mind is basically a tool. Our brain is a tool that receives information from the spirit. It's a computer. It processes information that comes from the spirit and then translates it into your body and everywhere else, you know, into your action and into the world the way you see the world. So spirit is number one. It is the most important thing. We're divine. And everything you do in this world is very important because you have a diary called the soul. Everything's written there. What you've done, every thought, every emotion, every action. Nothing's forgotten. Everything's recorded. And that's what you take away with you when you drop the body here. I and you have to be responsible for that. You have yes. to answer for all that. So when you understand that, that's what every major religion in the world talked about. Mm. It talks about we've lost our religions. In many places in the world, we've lost religions, which was a consistent effort. Um, so pe people lost that compass. And of course, religions were also had their own dark side. No doubt about it. All of them. But we have to have spirituality. It is very important for us to understand that we are divine beings. So if you, from that point of view, if you decide that you're a divine being and you look at the health in your body from that point of view, who can fix your spacesuit? You. Yes. yes. It's your spacesuit. <laughs> yes. Yes. You've created Don't let anybody it. else. Yes. You connect it to it. You fix it yourself. You take the screwdriver and the pliers and whatever you need, you know, and uh, and you fix it. And the screwdriver and the pliers are food. Mm. Food and your attitude to life, your honesty, the way you treat people around you, the way you treat animals, the way you treat nature, the way you treat everything living in this world. And another thing I would like to say that the science in the Western world in particular is a slave of the materialistic point of view they're not allowed to even entertain the idea of spirituality. I'll tell you a story. I was driving, I was um, traveling on a train from Wales, which was a long journey, because I live in East Anglia. And uh, as it happened, I sat down and the chap came and sat opposite me, we started talking and he turned out to be a, a professor of mathematics from the Cambridge University. And we started talking. And when I mentioned to him that human beings are divine, beings we have to that our science will always be one-legged always will be lame as yes. long as it studies life on earth like a machine our science is trying to study life on earth as a machine as a, as a material you know like a tractor or, yes. or a train or, or an engine or technology of some sort because we have two varieties of science and we have technology which deals with dead things yeah things made out of metal plastic and whatever else right and in that aspect we've achieved great heights and uh, 
they've made our lives very comfortable. We're using that right now mm. with the Zoom and the computer technologies yeah, and it's great. whatever communication. Great. But then we have living things in the world. We have humans, we have plants, microbes, animals, birds, insects, anything living in this world. They are trying to deal with the living world the same way they deal with things made out of metal or plastic. Yes. They and, are. and see them exactly the same way. They absolutely refuse to accept that there's something different about living things. And the, that's our mainstream science, which is in, in the in the clutches of those who rule the world. Yes. You know, in, in the deep state and whoever they are. And the their uh, their purpose is to turn the whole population into an idea that you are just an animal just a material thing that it's easy to become a cyborg it's easy to be enslaved or, or whatever else that that is that is their ideology that they yes. work very hard on on giving us all but the reality is that living objects are different we because we're divine yes we have a divine core divine center to all of us you know, scientists um, in, in one place have been studying death, for example, very interesting research to study death. So they would they would ask themselves a question, what happens at the moment of death? A few minutes before death, the person is talking, the breathing, the heart's beating, the nails are growing, the hair is growing, the body is warm. After the moment of birth, for a while, the body is still warm. Even the hair and nails are still growing. But something happened. Mm. So what happens at the moment of birth? And they had to come to the conclusion, and they had measuring instruments and other things, that something left. Yes. Something that was animating this body. Yes. And making it breathe and talk and be alert and, uh, and have consciousness. It left. And yes, so, I mean, I, I watched, sadly, I, I watched my father die. He was 83 and it took him a long time to die. It was it was it was quite horrific because he was in a care home and he had dementia and he was basically very dehydrated, extremely dehydrated at the end. But there was a, a moment when he was definitely animated and then he exhaled and he was gone. And you and it was what was left was this husk, and you know people were going up to it. But I was I'd never seen anyone die before. I'd never you know, because we're so removed from death at the moment in the West, aren't we? It's like something that happens behind uh, closed doors. It's in hospitals and places. It's all a clinical thing. And so seeing my father die, and then and then looking at what was left, and you're absolutely right there, there there is no way that you can say that he and whatever was animating him was still in there but had shriveled up and 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 had become like the rest of the body just a dry husk it had gone it didn't it it didn't die it it left where it went who knows but it was not there and and i think that's something that people we don't see that and we don't get that sense because I think if families again were much more closer at that moment of death you would become so much more aware of the fact that we are spiritual and and that they leave but again that's an, it seems to be another thing that no no it's all behind closed doors and uh, death is sort of seen as a, a murky thing death is just as beautiful as birth we need to remove this fear of death Mm. in our society and uh, this idea that death is some tragedy and that if you die you somehow failed yes, <laughs> that we're yes. all supposed to live forever and there's many people uh, giving those ideas that we, we we're supposed to live 200 years people give different numbers some go all the way to 2000 wow <laughs> you know? uh, it, it's it's um, it's quite funny you know it's just different ideologies coming mm. in different brainwashing coming coming into us but death is just as beautiful as birth is birth is entering this material world death is leaving it's a relief it's it, it's a liberation you know people translate their own stress and, and their trouble because many people 
rely on this person. Maybe this person was a breadwinner. Maybe mm. this person looked after the household. Maybe this person, you know, was fulfilling many important functions in the family. So when you lose that person, people immediately think, oh, my God, what am I going to do now? Yes. I've lost my support. I've lost somebody who looked after me. And th that's why they cry. They don't cry about that person. They cry about themselves. Yes. It's a that's very what, selfish reaction, isn't it? That, that's what usually happens. But what we do on my farm, because on my farm I have volunteers. We had hundreds of young volunteers from all over the world. There are some these this lovely groups online where you could sign up and, you know, invite people to volunteer. And uh, we teach them organic farming. And part of it is how to slaughter animals and birds. Right. And we often do it with cockerels because the ideal ratio of cockerel per hens is one to five to nine. Right. Then it's harmonious and it works. Like in a microbial community, there must be harmony on the farm. There has, yes. must be balance on the farm. But in every clutch of eggs with, that the chicken hatches, because all our chicks are hatched by, by broodies, by broody hens. So every clutch of chicks has a mama, and the mama teaches them how to be a chicken and looks after them. And in every clutch like that, there's usually half and half boys and girls. Mm. So we finish up with far too many cockerels. And not of, all of them manage to create a family, a harem for themselves, you know, with five or nine chickens. So lots of them run around, they become hooligans and, and they become simply, they, they fight and yes. they, they damage chickens. It's very hard on, on the hands. So they have to be, you have to maintain balance on your family, you, on, your fa on your farm. You have to manage the farm. So they have to go to the freezer, these cockles. We have to reduce their numbers. Yes. It's very important on the farm. So we, we slaughter the cockles ourselves on the farm and all our volunteers um, participate in that. We had many vegans coming here, which we have transformed. And uh, many vegans who are now recovering, vegans. <laughs> and they all participate in this. It doesn't have to be brutal. We do it gently. We do it with love. We thank the bird. We all stroke the bird. One person holds the bird to their chest and other people stroke him and thank him for everything. And as we cut the throat, because we bleed the animal and that's how the animal dies, you almost feel the moment when the spirit leaves, when the soul leaves. And when you experience that, you experience it on some other level, on level of other senses rather than the mind. You just right. understand. It clicks. Every human being needs to experience that. Human beings used to live in on farms. They used to live in tribes. They used to live in communities where they produced their own food. Yes. So children were exposed to that from a very young age. To, to slaughter, to plucking, to cleaning, to eating them, cooking and eating that animal. You know, so children never had silly ideas about death. Mm. They knew it on a level of a spine, you know. Yes. <laughs> Yes. I don't know, on a visceral level. You, you learn something on a visceral level, bypassing the brain, bypassing the mind. You just know. Yes. There are, there are things we just know. You don't need proof. You don't, it, yeah. exactly. and you don't I, need proof. And the because you know that it's just so. It is just, yes. And I, yeah. I, I guess if you're in that environment, as we used to be, as you say, you have so much more respect for that animal that, as Absolutely. you say, you've, you've thanked it and given it up. And, you know, in this day and age, when I see, say, people falling out of pubs, going to a, a, a chicken takeaway place where factory produced chickens who've had no love whatsoever and have been dispatched on an industrial scale and people just buy these things and then they don't even eat them properly or they're sick or they have no respect for the food that they're then eating. You, you know, that respect for the, the, the life of that one chicken has been abysmal all the way through its life. And then how it's been murdered and turned into some sort of substitute food with extra things in it. And then people aren't even eating it because they're, you know, it's fast food. It's sort of so disposable. It That... I mean, that to me is so sickening in and of itself. It would stop me from purchasing 
food in that way. But we've got a lot of work to try and get people to see that, to have that respect. We do, we do. But every person is on their own journey, on their own growth path, you know. A mm. person has to reach a certain level before they can even hear you. Yes. Or what you're saying to them. You know, they, they, they don't even... If, if they're far too low than your level, what you're trying to tell them, they can't even perceive. Right. They don't hear you. Yeah. A person has to accomplish a certain certain journey. You know, death, when, when you slaughter an animal, if it's slaughtered in some faceless abattoir, which is full of cruelty, it's terrible, the, the way it's organized in this world, mm. to the way we slaughter our cockles, you turn murder into a noble death, into a noble... He, this cockerel gives its life to sustain our life. Yes. You cannot waste a morsel of this animal, and we do not. Every bit goes for, for food. You know, the feet, the necks, the head, the organs go for soup. And they make the most amazing soup, so we clean everything thoroughly, properly. And I tell you, we had dozens of vegans here who... Uh, the very thought, the very idea of actually slaughtering something was, Oh no, you know, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm yes. not going to participate in that. But once they observed it, we don't ask them to do it. They observe it and they participate and they thank the animal. Once they've been through it, something just lights up in their eyes. And then they're sitting, plucking away perfectly happily and cleaning the whole, the whole <laughs> thing. I just smile to myself. Yes, <laughs> yes. Every time I observe that. It's beautiful. Something just clicks because we are spiritual beings. So once you put that little puzzle piece in the right place, mm. it's fine. They haven't got that problem anymore. Yes. That, yes. that killing is wrong and it shouldn't be done and all of that. You know, if you look at this world, everything eats everything in this world. You know, yeah, predators yes. eat animals. These animals eat grass. The grass eats microbes. You know that uh, plants are carnivorous? Are they? Yes. We now have a fascinating research. What happens? The plants create sugars through photosynthesis yes. in their leaves. Yes. And then they send these sugars into the roots and the, the hair roots underground. And these hair roots ooze those sugars into the soil to attract the microbes. Microbes get attracted to sugars. They come inside the cells of the root. And then these cells, which is on this kind of like a, a food processor, bzzz, pulverizes them and absorbs them. Right. So these, these microbes, you know, die a most brutal death. <laughs> yeah oh gosh Are inside the roots of the plant so plants eat microbes they eat meat yes they're carnivorous and if you die and your body is buried and you planted a tree on your grave you know in many instances they when they were plowing the the former cemeteries or other places they would find that the roots of the tree completely shaped in the form of the body of the person really? that was buried under that root Wow. The tree has eaten the body because meat is the best nourishment for them. Any gardener will tell you that the best nourishment for their soil is meal, uh, fish meal, blood meal, meat, right. meaty water, things like that. So plants yes. are carnivorous and uh, microbes then eat each other and they eat us and they eat any dead animal or any dead insect or anything dead that falls on the ground, the microbes would consume. It's a circle of life. Yes. Everything eats everything. No energy gets wasted. Everything stays within this material world. Who created all of this? Not me. No. Not you. Not no. a vegan. Not a vegetarian. <laughs> no. You don't come to somebody else's house and start dictating to that household how they should live. Right? Yeah. You have to. You, you're a guest there. We are guests in this world for a short period of time. We have to accept the rules of this home. Yes. Who is in charge of this home? It's creator. Who rules it? It's creator. We have to respect that who created it and all the rules that this home functions upon. Yes. Everything, it's everything, everything kills everything in this world. So we have to understand that that's the way it is. And stop coming up with our own exalted mental ideas, what should be and what shouldn't be. Yes, absolutely. So why, why do you suppose that we... We've fallen so much away from this in, in that we've built this modern world in which we have removed ourselves from nature and 
put ourselves into these boxes that we call houses that we've close the windows so they're hermetically sealed so you know effectively nothing comes in and everything comes in in on a polystyrene box with cellophane over the top and and all this sort of artificialness moving us away from all of what you've described as as part of the necessary circle of life what, not so much the, the 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 political side of it but why has man fought against what seems to be the Garden of Eden all around us and that we're part of it? It's the birth and evo evolution of technocratic society and technocratic mind, I guess. It's... Because, you know, um, all the grief in the world comes from the mind. Right. Our mind is not our, our biggest friend, I have to say. You know, if you follow the mind, particularly if you follow the modern science, which is all technocratic entirely. If you want to lose your way in life, follow the science. Yes. You know, yes. particularly as... the science which deals with living objects, yes. medicine just... in particular. Yeah. So <laughs> we, just, we just became more and more technocratic because technocracy is um, seductive. Yes. It promises a lot. It seduces you. With this comfort and that comfort and this pretty and that gadgety and this can do that and this can do that and it moves the person further and further away from the spirit the soul the war that we have going on in the world now because we're in the midst of a third world war and many people don't realize it mm. that we're at war that war is not fought in a military way with guns and tanks and whatever in some places it, does, it is but yes not, not not all over the world this war is fought on a level of mind and on the level of spirit and those who are fighting us those who are after us are after our soul after our spirit that's the ultimate the ultimate goal that they want they want to suppress it they want it to make it asleep to go to sleep the deepest sleep the better and, and they want to take it away from you. We have to wake up. What we, the, the entertainment we have had for two years in 2020-21, yes. you know, <laughs> that woke up a lot of people. Yes, definitely. World. Unfortunately, yes. not the majority, as usual, not the majority. Mm. But many, many people have woken up and realized that we are at war. And, we and need uh, to... what, what, what's what's next entertainment they're preparing for us? <laughs> yes, <laughs> but, we, but but somebody like you and and the other awakened uh, and enlightened people and and with your research uh, are, are um, helping so much people to be awakened that the the spirit is there that we feed ourselves the right food so that we can feed our bodies and be more healthy and stay around and come up with solutions and and talk to other people and and build back a community of like-minded souls yes yes absolutely people are teaching each other people are helping each other we need to talk human mm. beings talk yes yes and we need to talk from the heart we need to have meaningful we have to have meaning in our conversation what's the point to talk about the weather <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a very you know. British thing. You know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. People sort of tick the box. I had a conversation with my neighbor. Yes. So superficial, so politically correct. You didn't have a conversation. No. You didn't. A conversation between two human beings has to be heart to heart about mm. issues that are really important to you. Yes. Deep issues. What's the point to have a small talk? It, but it's interesting how many people will not want to have that talk, that they're quite happy to stay at the superficial talking about the weather or the sporting event or whatever it was, you know, what was on the telly last week and not and not face perhaps difficulties or problems or look at things from the the other, you know, 180 degrees and say, well, what if this was a, a thing? or talking about the food that they're putting into them, like you've been talking about? Well, people, majority of people live on the level of fear. Yes. They're afraid. 
they're afraid if I say something like this or something like that, what consequences there may be. And we live in a world where there is no freedom of speech. The last nail in that coffin was put in the during the entertainment of the two years we had. You know, political correctness is uh, was taken. It, it was the tool that was launched by those who are waging the third world war on us. Was a tool that they waged upon us um, to take away our freedom of speech. What is freedom of speech? Freedom of speech is is the right to express your opinion at any time, anywhere, in the form that you want to express it, without any any limitations. Yes, that's been taken away gradually, insidiously, more and more. And I say the last nail was put in um, during the entertainment. Yes. Uh, so we, we have no freedom of speech. People are afraid to say what they think. That's the sad state that we're in. Country. Yes. I mean, I've, I've, I had it last week. Um, you may not know this, but last week I had a strike on YouTube. Uh, so I had seven days banned where I could do no, nothing. So it's mm -hmm. happened to me personally because something we said. And the thing is, they wouldn't even tell us exactly what it was we said. It was just something. So I know exactly what you mean. But we are fighting back and we, we are, are. Find, finding Absolutely. ways. And I'm grateful to people like you who are doing, doing your big bit. Well, I'm trying to, try, you know, because you're the real heroes. And, and if in my small way can introduce what the knowledge that you have, which is so important and having shared an hour in your company, which has been absolutely delightful and so invaluable to me and I know to my viewers, um, th this is this is the road that we're doing. And in some ways, what an amazing time to be alive when it it's is. so important that we do this work and more and more people are beginning to wake up to that fact. Absolutely, because what's happening, you know, the, the owner of this world, the creator of this world is now pushing us and saying, you have to take either that side or this side. Nobody's allowed to sit on the fence. Yes, yes. You're either with me or you're against me. Yes, absolutely. It's it's been an absolute joy, Natasha. Thank you so much for That's a pleasure. sharing That's a pleasure. your nice knowledge. Nice to meet you. Please, please just go through your books again. I'll put links to them, but uh, just so people can see them. Have you got them there, your books? Because well, this I'm... one is a gut and psychology syndrome. Yes. This one focuses on autism, dyslexia, dyspraxia, ADHD, ADD, schizophrenia, epilepsy. I have thousands of children who recovered from epilepsy That's all over amazing. the world. It is wow. curable. Any of these diseases can be helped. So that's if, if you have any problem with mental illness, please read this yellow book and follow the protocol here. Don't listen to anyone. Just stick to the protocol. This is a diet you're eating anyway, mm. right? You have to eat anyway. Yes. So you might as well eat correctly. Yes, absolutely. And if you eat correctly, you will see miraculous changes. Miraculous. This book I've written in 2020. Actually, uh, you know, thanks to the entertainment, I had time. To just sit down <laughs> yes. <laughs> Finish this book. Gut and Physiology Syndrome. Here I cover all autoimmune disease, allergies, arthritis of all kinds, neurological illness, hormonal illnesses. We live in a world of um, serious hormonal illnesses. Mm. That we, our, our young people now are, are just have been thrown into a terrible situation with yes. hormonal abnormalities and the uh, other illnesses, any physical illness. So whatever illness you have, including cancer, including cancer, please read this book and follow the protocol in this right. book. Wow, there we go. I have I'll... a book on vegetarianism. Which oh, I right, okay. We haven't had time to discuss this, maybe another time. Yes, no, I'd vegetarianism love to have you back. Vegetarianism explained. We have a, a very heavy, very forceful propaganda pushed upon the whole humanity and that is part of the the third world war that, that they're fighting with us they want to make the whole planet vegan yes because it is profitable for them first of all and because veganism makes you weak right it makes you weak on the level of your body on the level of your mind and on the level of your spirit so you are easier to enslave please just take that into your mind read this book it will explain to you where it's all coming from what the values of food are, what animal foods do for us, what plant foods do for us, 
to understand the whole issue. Please read this book. It's not a big book. It's it's quite thin. Yeah. Got nice pictures. <laughs> <laughs> but, but fully referenced. Yes. But the message okay. is the, the message is the important thing. I've got this book as well. On heart <laughs> oh, disease. lovely. Yes. <laughs> Put your heart in your mouth. It explains that cholesterol and fats do not cause heart disease. Right. They do not cause any disease. In fact, they prevent every disease and reverse them. Please, if you want to understand what does cause heart disease, please read this book. You wow. will understand it. There's there's some good reading there to be had. Thank you so much. I'll um, and they're all available presumably on all good bookshops and all of they that. Yeah, they're, they're all online. They're, excellent. they're all available online. I have uh, a website. My main website is called gaps.me. Gaps.me. That's I'll right. Put, there are I'll lots put of a... gaps websites out there because I've been training certified oh, right, gaps yes. practitioners for years. So um, there are literally thousands of websites with gaps. I will put my website is gaps.me. Brilliant. Yes, I will put the, a link to that as well. Um, so that's fantastic. Uh, Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, it has, as I said before, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm going to go and purchase your books and um, we're going to read them. Um, it's been it's been absolutely wonderful. And it would be lovely to have you back later on um, in the year and uh, find out more. Because I, I, be that's very kind of you. So there we thank are. Thank you very much for your work. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you. There you are, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you've enjoyed that and gleaned a hell of a lot. I know I have. It's, it's, a, it's an ongoing journey, and it's just fascinating to talk to wonderful people like Natasha um, and all those out there who are doing this amazing thing. So do check out gaps.me. Have a look at the books and uh, purchase them, understand them, change your diet follow the protocol all of that and uh, things will happen and miracles will happen and and we if ever we needed miracles i think it is now thank you once again dr natasha campbell mcbride i will be back on uh, more interviews and all of that until the next time from um, uh, natasha and i goodbye <laughs>